night, four people are dead in a crash near Peterborough. It was a head-on collision between a pickup truck and uh, an SUV. Another person is fighting for their life. We'll have the latest live from the scene. Plus... Especially given the situation of some of the long-term care homes and the stories that I've heard, we should be able to at least somewhat have some say as to where he's going to end up. We hear from a woman trying desperately to find a long-term care home for her father before the province chooses one for him. And I just couldn't believe that they did it again to another family. Others are coming forward to share their experience with national service dogs after a 14-year-old autistic girl had her animal taken away by the organization due to his weight. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We begin with a tragedy near Peterborough. Four people are dead and a fifth person fighting for their life tonight following a head-on collision this evening. Police are on scene investigating. And that is also where we find our Dale Minuckduck. Dale, what can you tell us? Yeah, Kelda, I'm here at Highway 7 in Drummond, lined at the center of this police investigation. The closed-off area stretches some seven kilometers all the way from Keene Road to Heritage Line. We know that at around 5.15, there was a head-on collision between a pickup truck and an SUV. As you mentioned, four people were pronounced deceased, a fifth one taken to a Toronto hospital and is in life-threatening condition. What we don't know is quite a bit. We don't know the age or the genders of the victims. As police say, they're still notifying next of kin. We also don't know which vehicle was responsible for this collision or which direction either of them were traveling in. We also don't know if speed or alcohol was a factor. So at this point, um, the cause of the collision is under investigation. Um, and I, I mentioned our officers, the um, reconstructionists, uh, the officers that attend the scene and, uh, and do their, you know, their calculations and their measurements. That's what they're working to find out right now. So, Kelda, the, as you mentioned, the investigation is still ongoing. Uh, it's pretty dark right now, but there are police down that way, about some 250 meters. There's also the vehicles that were involved and the victims remain on scene. Now, the road closure on Highway 7 will still take place until uh, for a few more hours. Acting Sergeant Robert Simpson does anticipate that it will be cleared up for early morning traffic. We also know that police have spoken to a few witnesses, but they're asking, as always, that anyone else especially those with video or dash cam footage, contact the Peterborough County OPP detachment. But a tragic, tragic night for these victims and their families, Kelda. Yeah, just a horrific tragedy. Thanks so much, Dale. That's our Dale Minuckduck near Peterborough tonight. A woman is dead and a man is in custody after a stabbing in Milton tonight. Um, we were called here at approximately 5.45 p.m. to an address uh, here in, on uh, Gosford uh, Crescent, Milton. Um, our officers did locate um, one female victim who was transported to hospital and, like I said, has uh, since been pronounced. Um, at that time, we did put out a message on social media uh, that we were seeking a male suspect, um, and we have since uh, arrested that suspect. Police say the victim and the accused knew each other, and they are not looking for additional suspects. A vigil was held in North York tonight for a 22-year-old who died last week while taking part in a protest in Iran. Ali Aragi attended high school at George Vanier Secondary School as well as Thornley Secondary in Thornhill. He died last Tuesday. He's a part of me. He's going to be a part of me forever. I mean, every time I hear his name, it's going to remind me of how he fought for his country, how he fought for his people. George Vanier is the school that my cousin went to. And when I see somebody like Ali, I see it's so close to home. I see that this is somebody that I could have run into on my daily route. This is somebody that I could have known. You feel, what is there left to do but fight for all the people that are left? Friends and family say Aragi was beaten to death. Protesters have taken to the streets in Iran for the past two months after Masa Amini died in police custody. As she was detained for reportedly wearing her hijab incorrectly. Human rights activists estimate 400 people have been killed and more than 16,000 have been arrested as a result of Iran's violent crackdown on protesters. 
Well, some families in the province are urgently trying to find a suitable long-term care home for their loved one after new legislation came into effect this week that allows Ontario hospitals to charge patients hundreds of dollars a day if they refuse to be transferred to a long-term care home chosen by the hospital. Lorena Redekop spoke with one woman now scrambling to find a home for her father, unsure how soon her family could potentially be facing those steep fines. Caroline Konsik is racing to find a long-term care home for her father. He's been in hospital since October. We've only toured two so far. We've called about 10 others and most people aren't taking bookings right now just because of the COVID situation. She says he's on the crisis list for care. Last month, he fell and broke his arm. When the hospital discharged him, he stayed with her. He was confused. I was literally carrying him to the bathroom. I was spoon feeding him. I was giving him all his medications. He was not okay. She says he fell again. This time it was worse. Had a huge goose egg on his head. So I brought him to my living room and he was so confused. It sent him back to hospital. She recently learned the family is being charged almost $2,000 a month, the equivalent fee of a long-term care home. It really threw me off. So now I'm like scrambling, trying to figure out what to do in this case. She and her sister are in their early 30s, now trying to learn and read up on everything. The hospital asked for a list of preferred home choices. Especially given the situation of some of the long-term care homes and the stories that I've heard, um, it's like we should be able to at least somewhat have some say as to where he's going to end up. She's unsure just how soon the GTA hospital he's in could pick a home for him. The $400 a day charges would apply if the family refused. So it can happen any time, I'm afraid. Natalie Mara is familiar with Consic's situation. Yesterday, her organization was among those that announced plans to launch a charter challenge, claiming the government's policy discriminates against the elderly. People call their in tears. They're so stressed. They're grieving already. And then to be under this enormous pressure to get out, get out, get out to anywhere. The government says the policy is freeing up hospital spaces and ensuring people who need long-term care get a spot. Just yesterday, Konsik visited another home. The tour is really, really good. I'm feeling a little bit more hopeful, um, just knowing that there are some great people out there. But like many homes, it has a long waiting list. She hopes having her father on the crisis list will help find a spot in a home her family approves of. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Let's go to meteorologist Colette Kennedy now with a first look at the forecast and Colette temperatures feeling closer to seasonal these couple of days after the frigid weather we got last week. Yeah, I know. And when you have those temperatures back to seasonal, it makes it feel mild compared to last week. But today, you know, a bit of a switch going on across southern Ontario in terms of some into the cooler air like Ottawa at minus one and Barrie at minus one and then a bunch of sevens here for the daytime high. We had that cold front that was going through last night, but then it kind of met up with some warmer air to the south and you get like a stationary front uh, across the area and just kind of that battle between the two air masses and that kind of impacts what we see with the temperatures. Overnight tonight, we do have calm conditions, just a few areas with a little bit of cloud at times. Into tomorrow, it's mostly sunny as high pressure takes over. I think it's going to be perhaps the nicest day of the whole week, even if there may be a few days that are slightly warmer. Just with that sunshine, it's going to feel pretty good because the winds won't be very strong. That sticks with us and things start to change a little bit into Thursday. When I come back, I'll explain what I mean with that. But tonight, your low minus two, a high of six for tomorrow. Thanks so much, Colette. Today marks National Housing Day. In Toronto, a rally was held as a call for action on the ongoing housing crisis. Uh, well, we have a very challenging situation in Toronto. Last night, we sheltered 8,200 people, um, about 1,600 more people than we've uh, sheltered about a year ago, more than we ever have before. Uh, and the opportunity for housing is uh, very challenging with the affordable, affordability issues that we have and the, the lack of income supports that people receive uh, to find housing. Park was organized by the Shelter and Housing Justice Network. People gathering to demand immediate construction of more social housing to help address the need for affordable housing options. 
The city of Hamilton says it has just discovered sewage has been leaking into the Hamilton Harbor for 26 years. Now it's because of a hole in a combined sewage pipe in the industrial sector. Now it's unclear exactly how much sewage has spilled into the harbor, but the director of Hamilton Water today said it's going to be a quote big number. The hole was just discovered this morning. A city staff say residents drinking water residents drinking water has not been affected, but the spill will have impacted the environment of the harbor. Well, last week we brought you the story of a Mississauga family who said their dog was taken from their nonverbal daughter with autism. National Service Dogs says it was due to the dog being overweight and said it was a last resort. Well, after that piece aired, others reached out with similar stories about the organization. Telly Ricci spoke with a few of them. Chad Eden says his service dog Norman saved his life. He's a veteran and suffered from PTSD after serving in Afghanistan. CBC News featured his story in 2015. It's for veterans with PTSD. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you're training the dog? No, he's for me. He seems really special. He is. But in 2020, he says Norman was taken away by National Service Dogs. COVID started. And like I didn't leave my house for like a whole year after that. <laughs> I really need him. He said NSD initially said over the phone the reason was due to breaching the contract because his ex was looking after the dog. In email correspondence, NSD notes concern for the dog's general well-being and ongoing health, something Eden disputes. That dog saved my life. He was, he meant the world to me. I just couldn't believe that they did it again to another family. Marcia Welch says her then seven-year-old son with autism also had his service dog Presley taken away by the organization in 2016. I was just in so shock. Like I was crying all weekend. Like it just ruined our family. She says this happened after the dog's annual public access test and her son, who she says was having a bad day, accidentally hit the dog. We know how to like get the dog away from him whenever he's having this kind of thing. We ended the public access test with the impression that we were just going to reschedule it. CBC News also spoke with four people who said they were previously involved with the organization who did not want to be identified. They said some dogs were selectively removed from homes and not enough support was provided to families afterward. The Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario says three applications regarding national service dogs have been submitted over the last decade. CBC Toronto asked NSD's executive director, Danielle Forbes, about these clients. She didn't address them directly, but said in a statement, at National Service Dogs, providing for the safety, physical and mental well-being of our service dogs is not only a contractual obligation for our clients, but how we honour the dog's unconditional love and service. Adding, over the past 26 years, NSD has deployed 580 dogs to Canadians in need. Chad Eden wants the organization to spend more time working with clients. I never saw him again. They have no idea how he acts around me. They have no idea if he would be comfortable living with me anymore. Like, there was nothing. It was just, he was gone. Talia Ricci, CBC News. Welcome back. Some of the most protected lands on the green belt in Pickering could soon make way for subdivisions. The Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve is the largest area that could be opened up for housing development as part of the Ford government's proposed plans to develop sections of the protected green belt. Now, this move could be a windfall for a prominent GTA developer who was a primary landowner there. Ryan Patrick Jones looks into the nearly 20 year battle over whether to protect the lands or pave the way for development. It's a vast expanse of protected farmland east of Toronto in North Pickering, around 2,000 hectares in total, whose fate has long been contentious. Silvio de Gasparis of Vaughan-based TAC Developments started buying protected properties for cheap here in 2003, but his hopes of one day building homes were dashed two years later, when the province included the preserve in the green belt. The Liberals also passed a law protecting it for agricultural use only. By then, de Gasparis had launched a campaign to embarrass then-Premier Dalton McGuinty and eventually spent millions on lawsuits pushing to develop there. Eventually, those efforts failed and the land has stayed protected ever since. But now the Ford government plans to open up several areas of the Greenbelt it claims will help tackle Ontario's housing shortage. The area, including the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve, is the largest chunk that could be opened for housing. The province is also planning to repeal the legislation protecting the preserve. We won at the time. We thought we were done. 
We have the agricultural easements. We have it in the green belt. It's probably the most protected land in all of Ontario. This grassroots activist and former regional councillor fought to protect the preserved lands more than 20 years ago. If the green belt is allowed to be touched now, what about all the other developers that own land in the green belt? Are they lining up at Doug Ford's door already? If it's going to die by the death of a thousand cuts. CBC found more than a dozen properties in and around the preserve that are owned by companies controlled by Silvio de Gasparis and his brothers, Carlo and Michael. Attack development spokesperson told CBC Toronto the family was out of the country, so they couldn't comment on the future of the properties. But Pickering Mayor Kevin Ash says he wants to see a mix of housing. This uh, choice in the housing, uh, lower to the ground, single family as well as uh, other options, I think is a good mix and it's something I think will be welcomed by our community. Any building on the farmlands here will have to happen quickly. The province says it wants to see construction start by 2025 or they will stay protected inside the green belt. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. And you are looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. Partly cloudy tonight, becoming mainly clear overnight and feeling similar to last night. Currently, it is four degrees in the city. Let's go back to Colette now for a more detailed look at your forecast. And Colette, I'm sure many will be happy to hear we will be seeing some sunny skies tomorrow. Yeah, just a beautiful day is really shaping up for us. And that's why my headlines, I put wonderful Wednesday. It really does look that way with lighter winds, sunshine, temperature seasonal, uh, a nice way to kind of get you through that hump day of midweek. But temperatures, they remain seasonal through the next several days, or if anything, a little on the mild side, a few degrees at times heading above seasonal, but we do have showers developing towards the end of the week. We'll start to get a difference in the cloud deck into Thursday and then get into some of that wet weather for the end. So overnight tonight, we have some kind of variable, partly cloudy skies, not much to this, nothing to worry about. Then we get into sunshine here through the GTA around the Golden Horseshoe. This is noontime on your Wednesday, back into southwestern Ontario. A few areas with a little bit of fair weather cloud, but should be some high thin stuff. But that begins to change into Thursday. Early on, some nice bright skies, but then we'll see some mid-level clouds starting to move in. So we'll kind of call it variable there on Thursday. And then that rain, this is 11 o'clock Thursday, beginning to approach, moving closer to cottage country overnight Thursday, but uh, likely not reaching the city until we do get into Friday, and that's why I have it then in my forecast. Uh, a little cooler in southwestern Ontario tonight, minus 8 to minus 10, the wind chill, and the numbers also still on the chillier side, at least than what we're going to see around most of the Golden Horseshoe, a few exceptions, slightly cooler for Oshawa and for Markham and Hamilton, and at minus 4, but otherwise 4, Pearson minus 2 degrees the temperature overnight tonight. A look at tomorrow with that six degree daytime high and the sunshine. Thursday, it's still going to be a decent day. It just changes a little bit with the sky conditions, okay? Seven degrees. Look what's happening with the overnight low there. So Friday, it's mild, but we do get into some wet conditions. I don't think this is anything that significant. Probably five to ten millimeters of rainfall in here. Uh, the areas where it would be of concern would be the areas that have the snowpack with the melt that we'll be getting and then rain on top. Some flash flooding could become a concern in those specific areas. All right, thanks. It is a big day for Canadian soccer fans tomorrow. The men's team takes to the pitch for their first World Cup match in Qatar in less than 15 hours. Now, the last and only other time Canada made a World Cup appearance, 1986. And lacing up for the team tomorrow will be seven players from Brampton. Today, our Greg Ross caught up with a couple of coaches who helped shape their careers early on. Yeah, it's kind of surreal. As Greg Spagnoli walked onto the old soccer pitch at St. Edmund Campion Secondary School today, the fact that three of his former players here will compete at the World Cup tomorrow still hadn't fully sunk in. Yeah, we're just very proud of them. You know, as a school community, we're, we're, we're happy to play a small role in, in the development and, uh, you know, alongside their club coaches. Jonathan Osario, Kyle Laren, and Tejon Buchanan were all students at St. Edmund Campion, where Spagnoli is the longtime soccer coach. Did you ever think back then that those players would now be doing what they're doing now? Yeah, ironically I do. Uh, they, were, they had some sort of special talent, uh, diamond in the rough, so to speak. Davies, near post again, flicked on goal! Buchanan! Uh, at an earlier age, they had something about them that you could tell there was 
they were going to do something, whether they became professional footballers, I don't know at that point, but they definitely had an opportunity to, to pursue that avenue uh, so if they chose to do so. Oh, oh, so good! That same potential was also evident at an early age for Canadian captain Atiba Hutchinson. He was a leader because the players saw things in him. Desmond Gardner coached Hutchinson at a young age in Brampton. He says he's always had the ability to make the players around him better. He worked as hard as anybody else, he, and, and that's why he, you know, they, they, they saw that quality. They wanted to be with him because they knew that he was determined. He wanted to not only be the best that he could be, but he wanted everybody else to be the best that they could be. When these players take to the field tomorrow, they will be carrying the weight of their city and the entire nation on their shoulders. Your players right now can literally look at the World Cup stage and say, hey, there's at least three of those guys who came from the same school that I'm going to right now, played for this same team. Yeah, why not them? Why not them, right? Greg Ross, CBC News, Brampton. And finally tonight, if you happen to be walking around in Niagara, you may want to take a closer look at the ground. Scientists are asking residents in the area to keep an eye out for space rocks after a meteorite crash landed in Lake Ontario over the weekend. Now, the fireball, which was one meter in diameter, lit up the southern Ontario sky early Saturday morning. It ended up in the lake along the shoreline near Grimsby. Now, some of the space rocks could be up to four and a half billion years old. Scientists say they would be heavy and often have an outer crust that's black. If you find a space rock, scientists are asking that you consider donating your discoveries to the Royal Ontario Museum to be studied. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.